Okay, so um, I'm going to do this in three parts. Uh, first, we will look into how embodied gesture becomes mimetic on platforms such as TikTok. Um, since TikTok is what I promised, uh, I'll, I'll talk uh, about. Um, then in the second part, we will look uh, at how platforms in general uh, mediate affect through acts of sharing uh, in the sense uh, that they translate affect into data, uh, right? And vice versa. And obviously uh, it's a dynamic that is not uh, straightforward. And finally, um, we'll discuss how this apparatus, uh, and it's a term that I borrow from Wilhelm Flusser, can be analyzed uh, through plural approaches to online embodiment. Good, so this is our case in point, uh, Trump and his uh, disinfectant speech uh, three years ago uh, during the first pandemic lockdown. Um, in terms of its framing, right? It's an event of peak intensity, a short-lived viral event. Uh, it's clearly situated temporally and socially in the vibes uh, of COVID lockdowns. And what's interesting here is not Trump himself as this populist figure, but rather how this event reverberated on social media in ways that were very much embodied, right? So basically, um, what we are looking at here is a speech act that on platforms such as TikTok produced a whole environment of embodied performances, of gestures put on repeat. And you might, you might have forgotten the, the content of the speech, uh, but I'll remind you later. Good, so the reason why I engaged with this um, at all was the call by Tony Sampson uh, uh, for uh, an online conference. And then I wrote uh, a quick response uh, uh, to that call because, well, Trump happened precisely at the same time. And that, then I forgot uh, about this case. But then two years later, I stumbled upon another call again by Tony and uh, Yerne Markelli for the Mass Journal. Um, which has an art theory take on media studies. And I really liked the proposal of blurring digital media culture and thinking along with ambiguities and what Tony and Yerne call indistinction, right? So this blurry tension maybe between things that seem to be clear cut, but they are not. Okay, so this is how uh, this a paper emerged. It's not a traditional academic paper. It's rather messy and incomplete. Um, when I was writing it, I was thinking about indistinctions between embodiment and environment and how um, this digital gesture might work. Um, so how can it be both at the same time, something embodied but also embedded in an infrastructure? Um, yeah, so moving uh, to gestures, if we Google the term itself, ge gesture seems to be quite literal. It's a movement of the body to express an idea, a meaning, a state of mind. Uh, but it's not just a state, it's also an action. So it can be quite performative or theatralic even. Here I copied in just some further online definitions, and this is where things uh, start getting a bit more complex uh, because gesture appears to be more than human. Okay, so it extends the body to, to an environment of sorts. And especially if we think of digital environments um, and like of uh, UX designers, for them, a gesture can be an icon, which suggests a type of action you can select to share with others. So social media elements, um, and I'm thinking of reaction buttons, um, they should indicate if gestures can be performed on them to communicate a feeling or indeed an instruction. Um, an instruction uh, such as use this sound, okay? Apply this effect, do as this. Um, all instructions, but also actions that we are quite familiar with from TikTok. And this kind of made me think about the gesture of sharing on this platform as something that is embodied, but also embedded. 
Um, yes, yeah, some colleagues, um, and this is uh, Vincent Bilem, um, some would even compare TikTok sharing with an act of retweeting with your body, right? And declare a move towards a gestural web. Um, but now it's 1991 and Willem Flusser, right, who, who writes about gestures, um, suggesting that by observing gestures, we can try to discover what people mean when they use the word affect. And it's kind of an interesting uh, approach. So gesture for Flusser is a movement of the body or a tool connected to the body, but without any causality involved. So there is no cause and effect, but simultaneous agency or what he calls apparatus. And if we look at the contents of this apparatus or its elements, uh, here the gesture uh, of speaking, searching, filming, listening to music, turning a mask around, which is my favorite, um, it is, or it seems at least, as if Flusser invented TikTok in the 90s. So how can Flusser's gestures contribute to our understanding of TikTok sharing? For Flusser, technicity, or this apparatus, content, which is the body, and context of, uh, of the gesture are mutually codependent. On TikTok, all these dimensions collapse. Uh, human bodies and platform features perform as part of the same environment. And this environment um, is also very much engaged um, in shaping of gestures because it translates interactions into data. So searchable sounds from the sound library, hashtags, video effects, stickers, all of these networked possibilities for action make TikTok sharing part of a metadata machine, um, like an apparatus in which contact and capture collapse. What does it mean? It means that TikToks are variously networked, searchable, and templatable. And this network templatability potentially extends the body into a material for reenactment, replication, and imitation, uh, like imitation publics, uh, a paper that you might have encountered by Zuli and Zuli, uh, a paper that, it's, that went viral uh, in the academia. Um, however, as, as we will see later, a meme is more than um, a straightforward template. Uh, right, a straightforward type of imitation. For Flusser, a template is a feedback loop between images and people. On social media, and I'm paraphrasing here, we develop our use patterns according to the possibilities of networked image sharing. Um, and this process makes the images function better and better as models. Right, at least the causing to Flusser. Here is an example. A template can be understood as a model to replicate. A body can become a template. A cat effect uh, always works, so you kind of get the idea here. Uh, but can a model capture affect? Um, Trump, of course, is a model. It's like he's a meme, his gestures and voice are materials for imitation and counter imitation. But as a model or meme, Trump would be nothing without a platform, an apparatus. And this brings us back to the indistinction of embodiment and environment. In their role as gestural ensembles, platforms are far from neutral, they do not just transmit, they prioritize uh, certain types of content and actions. So when an event goes viral, a platform informs it, okay? It kind of shapes the event uh, through distinct, but also networked possibilities for sharing. So on TikTok, human bodies are not the only bodies that act out affect. Uh, different digital objects draw together different types of content and add to these formations a particular stance. 
a hashtag such as don't drink bleach or a recording of Trump's voice that assembles imitation publics suggests a certain extent of sharedness. It acts out a shared state of mind, but again, in Flusser's terms, it also captures how through replication, affect becomes artificial. It becomes a performance or reenactment, which doesn't mean, however, that its meaning as is straightforward. On the contrary, sense and nonsense making collapse and affect in all its different registers, positive or negative, becomes the main driver of engagement. And this leads us to uh, the second part, platforms and affect. Uh, obviously, acts of sharing on social media are composed of distinct features, both these media objects. Uh, yeah, these media objects exist to engage. And if they fail to do so, they are getting replaced uh, or updated. Interactions feed back, uh, but then they also feed forward in anticipation of future engagement yet to come. And this is also what generates value uh, on social media. So commenting, uh, hashtagging, duetting, sound linking, um, all these distinct modalities of expression are indistinct in terms of their experience. In other words, affect is networked, but it does not mean that it has become more or less tangible. It simply remains intangible. And as we can learn from uh, this uh, edited collection, uh, which is, by the way, one of my uh, favorite networked uh, affects or, you know, affects, uh, this Uh, so one question is, what is tangible at all? In the front end, we perceive platforms as never-ending flows of content, content that generates attention and receives interactions, usually appears on the top, or usually it's also, um, you know, the most recent content. So either popularity or uh, kind of recency or both at the same time. So updates attract clicks and distract us from other actions. But at the same time, in the back end, interactions register as data or even as data multiplicities, singular acts of sharing, such as adding sounds or applying video effects, uh, they produce a whole ensemble of metadata. Um, like, you know, when we uh, here click on this button, add sound, um, it kind of results uh, in uh, a several in several data points: uh, creator name, duration, title, um, what else, uh, music author, and so on. So this makes TikTok a metadata machine within which user actions are valuable, not because they are creative, but because these actions activate relations uh, between uh, distinct formations of data. Um, yeah, this is quite central, I guess. Affect is not contained in this ensemble. Instead, it translates into intensities of contact as it moves bodies from one state of relation to another. So a very kind of Deleuzean uh, take um, on, on affect here. Just as it registers as data, affect also shapes social encounters that escape uh, clear-cut categorizations, uh, such as uh, you know, empowerment uh, or straightforward visibility. Distinct affective affordances channel indistinct forms of engagement. So indeed, we can like with the like button, but using the same button, we cannot follow. For this, there is another feature. Socially speaking, we when we when we follow someone on a platform, we do not necessarily like. Okay, so the same action can mean multiple things at the same time, um, and the affect informing this engagement is not measurable, but it's data intensive. 
This brings us to the apparatus of sharing and to the question, um, what makes it work? Okay, so according to the universe of technical images, and TikTok is a universe of technical images, an apparatus must be fitted with keys so that we can manipulate it. So Flusser here uses the gesture of tapping with the fingertips on the keys of an apparatus as a metaphor for a procedure that he calls calculate and compute. This procedure makes combinations of elements possible. So you don't just use a sound on TikTok, you might also combine it with a video effect because you care about the searchability of your content according to different modalities. So you kind of try to pre-program your visibility within a formation of other images. You want to become a meme. A meme, however, is more than a straightforward template. In the sense of attention-grabbing strategies, searchability, traceability, and so on, a sound adding button is a copyright grammar. It makes novel content part of a bigger searchable formation of memes. Most content creators, however, upload their videos with the so-called original sounds instead of using TikTok's music library. And ironically, what sounds as original is usually a copy. So original sounds uh, can range from ambient sounds to speech to the snippets or even full versions of listed sounds. But the difference is that original sounds can be recorded, edited, remixed, and republished without any indication of source. So this affordance blurs the moments of source and adaptation, contact, and capture. And as soon as a sound meme goes viral, searchable templates turn into a messy cascade of audiovisual riffs. And this is what I was um, interested in. Um, this is here the, the actual case, uh, and I'm just going to try and play it for you. We hit the body with a tremendous... Does it work? Does the sound work as well? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Let's try again. Uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And I think you said that has him checked if you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. Right. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number in the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that so that you're going to have to use medical doctors. Right? But it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. Okay, so you might remember Sarah Cooper. Uh, she was viral uh, cross-platform the day after Trump's speech. Beth Midler filmed Cooper's TikTok performance, so a video screenshot of sorts, and posted it on Twitter with the caption, memes are coming in thick and fast. This, of course, is a perfect definition of an event of peak intensity. It links the body to the mimetic aspects of the internet, Virality, however, is a little bit more complex than that. When we hit the body with mm. a tremendous... We don't want that, just a second. Okay, this is what we want. Okay, my understanding of virality is inspired by Tony Sampson's reflections on networked contagion. Contagion here is not a biological but social metaphor, which goes back to Gabriel Tard's notion of imitation. One point that I'm interested in in particular is that viral events of peak intensity are not only about high impact posts of the kind shared by Sarah Cooper, but rather they are mostly about micro imitations that are barely visible 
when it comes to trend detection. In other words, what goes viral requires a long tail. It involves repeated acts of sharing that registers minor deviations from content that makes it to the top. And these micro imitations are the main driving force of mimification. And given the absurdity of Trump's speech as source material, it's not surprising that related search queries uh, for the keywords disinfectant and injection uh, one day after um, were about memes, right? So public perception of such events at that time was more than ever mediated through attention-grabbing content. Pandemic boredom was making headlines along with TikTok, which kind of became uh, the most downloaded app precisely because of the emphasis on short videos, um, uh, lip sync, comedy, and so on. On Twitter and Facebook, disinfectant hashtags mimicking Trump or disinfectant content mimicking Trump uh, were soon deplatformed, but of course, in a competition uh, between memes and content warnings, memes clearly win. So even if related content gets blocked on some platforms, on other platforms, what remains is indeed uh, this long tail or a series of attempts at trend hijacking. Of course, each platform comes with its own attention-grabbing techniques on TikTok, possibilities uh, of studying reverberations of an event like this derive from its specific strategies of crossing and circulating content. And this is what brings us to hashtagging, duetting, and sound linking as trajectories for navigating this long tail on TikTok. Um, and each feature provides a new perspective on the same event, uh, right? So um, now what I'm going to do, um, I will try to reflect on how we can study um, an event like this through its platform-specific um, reverberations using uh, the case of TikTok. So what can we do? I, I could have used Sarah Cooper's recording of Trump's speech as an entry point, right? So this original sound, which is clickable. And this sound uh, has been, of course, reused by many other creators, but it would also mean that I would engage with a relatively homogeneous formation of videos sharing the same formal element, this sound. But being interested in reverberations, I was, um, I, I was, I kind of tried to create a research design that would be attuned to the multiplicity of the event. So I scraped data based on related hashtags um, that indicate irony. So what we see here is that at least at the level of denotation, um, like literal meaning. Um, inject disinfectant and don't drink bleach, gesture towards oppositional intentions. But considering all the absurdity, of course, it's not what happens. The question is what holds these seemingly distinct uh, mimetic formations together. With this relational approach, it's important to think about uh, the um, multifarious character of hashtags as network designers. Uh, the purposes of cross-hashtagging content on any platform are blurry, right? Uh, instead of polarizing, uh, content formations overlap, or at least they can polarize and overlap at the same time. So what we see also here is that inject is infectant and don't drink bleach uh, were used in the same posts. So understanding how vernacular content of this kind becomes entangled through hashtags, uh, but also extends uh, through other um, networked artifacts uh, is key, methodologically at least. So what this approach allows us to do is um, it allows us a form of cross-reading, which can rely, for example, on co-hashtags and video captions, so additional textual information. 
Combining these two perspectives allows studying the blending of meaning, okay? But then also the contestation of visibility. Hashtags are network designers. They make content searchable across platforms. Uh, with Zizi Papakarisi, we could argue that hashtags attune content and channel the acts of sharing. Um, video captions, on the other hand, are contexting practices. They strongly indicate stance uh, like irony or warnings. Bringing these two elements in a network provides us with a situated understanding of how, to, of how um, content happens on a platform and how relations between different zones of engagement around, uh, in our case, disinfectant videos unfold. Asking what connects don't drink bleach and inject disinfectant one can identify three overlapping formations of content. Uh, and if we look uh, here at these breaching nodes, uh, we have co-hashtags such as uh, comedy and Trump, um, quarantine and funny, uh, coronavirus and viral. Uh, but what connects all three of these formations are for you page. Hashtags, which are very common on TikTok because they are used to indicate viral intentions. So what makes them interesting is that they are part of the so-called algorithmic gossip or algorithmic imaginaries, which is a, a, a term by Taina Bucher. And uh, well, this, uh, this aspect is very characteristic of TikTok, uh, for TikTok and um, it does not imply virality. So using for you page hashtags does not imply actual virality, but it gestures towards users' ambitions to become a meme by ending up on TikTok's algorithmically curated recommendation page, for you page. So co-hashtags or semantic relations connecting don't drink bleach and inject disinfectants um, and what you see here is uh, just another very reduced view of the same network. Um, these relations are, are not surprising, right? So these co-hashtags are quite, uh, well, yeah, uh, obvious. Um, they, they are about the showing of sharedness uh, and post-based virality ambitions rather than clearly uh, demarcated publics. And here, ambiguity. Uh, rules, uh, right? So uh, something like, uh, I don't know, clean and virus uh, and, uh, I don't know, social distancing, obviously, uh, and so on, Trump co-hashtags. Um, they, of course, assemble very um, hybrid formations of content. And later we can uh, have a look at how associations between hashtags and video captions can help us to interpret the stance of these content formations. Basically engagement in all three zones is connected to different TikTok challenges, uh, but also pandemic storytelling, boredom and nonsense making. Uh, so through these co-hashtags, we could access videos about mixing disinfectant cocktails, and mimicking drinking bleach while being bored in the house uh, during the lockdown. Uh, so content formations that are tongue in cheek basically, but then they are also about fatigue communication and uh, trend surfing or trend hijacking. Okay, but what about gestures and especially embodied gestures? What happens if we look at TikTok performances networked through these hashtags, um, and how can we study uh, right, these formations as mimetic stratifiers that indicate absurdity but still invite imitation? Working with the social moving image on TikTok involves an exploration of how imitation plays out through networked embodiment. TikTok networks are designed to make the gestures stick, 
uh, in both these movements is what drives the meme, which makes uh, repetition a matter of social choreography and infrastructural amplification. The question is, how can we study all this without amplifying certain types of content even further? So with Whitney Phillips, how do we take out the oxygen out of the meme or you know, the energy, the magic out of the meme? Obviously, negotiating ethics when working with that worked body images is not easy. Um, ethical anonymization, as in pixelating faces, can be helpful. Um, but what, what about the fluid nature of movement itself? How can we capture movement that drives imitation across different contributions? To some extent, what we need here is a form of fabrication. Um, and this is where I, I kind of try to think along with the blur, the blur as a method of ethical fabrication, uh, which is also a method of indistinction. Uh, what it does, it deconstructs dynamic content into a series of distinct static frames, and then it, it restacks the frames in new visual artifacts. So these restacked videos uh, assembled in a grid allow us to trace embodied imitation. We can read them both horizontally within each of the content formations, but also vertically across different co-hashtags. What comes to the fore here is collective mimicry and how embodied gesture of disinfectant injection indicates mimetic power precisely due to its absurdity. But what we also see are drastic shifts in engagement metrics. So like here, the count of likes. Um, creators' intentions uh, are viral, but obviously only several performances manage to gain traction. The blur is also um, especially well suited for zooming in on the feature of duet. Unlike the stitch, which incorporates someone else's content in a new video sequence, a duet allows for a juxtaposition of two videos playing next uh, to one another at the same time, uh, often for purposes of attention hijacking. So in terms of studying how gestures capture affect, Duetting stands for this porosity of, or indistinctions indeed, of self-other relations. It's again a term uh, proposed by, by the special issue. So for what, what this uh, feature kind of elevates are the overlaps of performing bodies produced through imitation and counter-imitation. Okay, so now the third and final perspective on the gesture of sharing the question of what resonates through sounds, through sound linking. Together with a colleague of mine uh, from Amsterdam, uh, Marlus Gebors, um, I've been thinking on the notion of networked soundscapes. On TikTok, sounds, like other digital objects, assemble content, uh, which means that embodied performances are networked in this uh, multimodal way. Different modalities of sharing provide different perspectives on the same formation of content. Um, and what hashtags, for instance, make visible at the same time may be less prominent when accessed through sounds and vice versa. So sounds and hashtags can be a source of mutual amplification or they can remain disengaged. And what comes out of these networked soundscapes evokes specific kinds of resonance, the intensities of which, and this is a quote by Susanna Parsonen, um, the intensities of which do all these uh, things at various speeds as user attention and interest circulates, shifts, and relocates. And I don't have to, to add uh, anything to this definition conceptually, but methodologically, 
we can try to trace the extent to which sounds and hashtags are attuned to one another, and we can also try to show different trajectories of content circulation. So what we see here are our main co-hashtags connecting don't drink bleach and inject disinfectant. Um, and they connect these ecologies in relation to sounds that were used in the same DZOs. We see the prevalence of the original sound, which mostly contains recordings of Trump's speech, uh, imitations of his voice, other usually ironic uh, or outraged comments. Then we see event-specific listed sounds, so searchable sounds, uh, such as inject the disinfectant, um, what else, drink bleach, uh, Trump disinfectant. And then there are also popular pandemic tunes, uh, such as Bored in the House or It's Corona Time. One way of navigating networked soundscapes can be achieved by assembling videos through sounds and cross-reading these formations. Hashtags contextualize um, content in these formations and attune them to searchable trends. So by zooming in on different trajectories of networked performance through sounds, but also hashtags, we can study how um, acoustic environments resonate and create different attachments, um, associations, basically that stick bodies together um, in larger content formations. Zooming in on just one example, uh, which is the popular tune by Detroit uh, rapper Curtis Roach. You might also remember that one. It was quite a uh, catchy um, board in the house. Uh, the song. Um, so this song went viral one month before Trump's disinfectant speech happened, and it quickly became a pandemic meme. And this is the last uh, example I'm going to show you. And then I would say let's let's um, yeah let's switch uh, to uh, to something more interactive. Um, so. Board in the House quickly took off, not just as a sound, but also as a hashtag, a hashtag also present in Trump disinfectant publics. Uh, so what we see here is the original video by Curtis Roach. It's here. Um, yeah, you see here you see the like count. Uh, the video was published in March 2020, and then these uh, little uh, data points here. Uh, these are all videos that use this sound in pretty unrelated contexts. And these Trumpy memes, or, you know, disinfectant memes, um, are part of this long tail. Um, so here are just two attempts at reciprocal trends at humans. Both videos mimic drinking bleach while being bored in the house. Uh, the videos are strategically cross hashtags with uh, here challenge and uh, for you page. Um, and well, yeah, indicating again some extent of viral ambition. Uh, this linking strategy is intended obviously as a means of amplification. And yet resonance content that gets picked up by many in one effective constellation uh, which is pandemic boredom, because bored in the house uh, was really very, very present uh, as a meme at that time. Um, so yeah, uh, what uh, goes viral basically in one context has remained relatively unnoticed in another content formation, which is our disinfectant memes. Um, precisely also because uh, this this kind of trend also competes over user attention with other creative appropriations. So when studying such dynamics, uh, it's good to keep in mind that while the infrastructure or the apparatus of sharing, um, while it encourages scale, remix and meme cultures are about contextual drift and displacement, and so is their experience. Right, and I'm just going to close again with this slide. 
a gesture of sharing may formalize affect as a state of mind. It formalizes it through repetition, but it also makes uh, makes affect detached from singular bodies and contexts. And with this, yeah, I think also looking at the time, I should stop talking. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Elena. Let's turn the lights up so that Elena can uh, see you if somebody's behind that. Um,